This is a once in a lifetime exhibit. You'll never see so many significant Volkswagens, historic Volkswagens, drag cars, you name it, everything is here at the, as much as we could get. a couple times we haven't talked about this one yet so not too long ago um, I actually had the honor to go out and actually see this car right here Daryl Batone's car being lettered by you know one of the one of the greatest uh, you know guys in the business and it was it was a trick to actually go out and watch him do it by hand and um, you know We've seen the car basically coming together in the magazine, all of the details and everything. In fact, you know what? Look at this, you guys. We just happened to run into some of the people that might not know about. Wait, Russell, where are you going? Get back in here. Don't, you can't get away. You can't get away. So, uh, Dean, tell us about, about this car, a little bit of the history. I mean, I was just mentioning that a lot of people have kind of been watching the build right. and so forth. But, but tell us, you know. Okay, well. The car belonged to Daryl Vatone. Mm -hmm. Daryl Vatone was Joe Vatone's only son, and he worked at Envy from the age of 10 on. And, yeah. and so over the years, he had the Inchpincher 1, which was his 56 Street car. That turned into the Inchpincher 2. And then after that, he built the Fiat. And the Fiat was an H gas VW powered car. And when he initially started running that, uh, H right didn't like the roof on it they didn't like the front tires so he was trying to band-aid it and every time they still threw rocks at it so he decided i'm gonna have to tear this car apart and completely rebuild it so in 1974 he decided i'm gonna park the fiat and i want to get into this new class which was modified compact and so there was a and b modified compact and dave andrews his partner had run it to 73 and set the national record almost the whole year so Daryl goes, I need to do this. So this car came in as a trade-in in Econo Motors in late 73, and it had been hit on that side. Uh -huh. And so they told Daryl, hey, we got a 67 in, you've been looking for it, Is it do you want this car? And they said, absolutely. Wow. So they had to fix the body and do a couple modifications. And Daryl says, I don't want it baby blue, I want it, I've got it white. So they repainted it. <laughs> and so he built this car in a matter of a few months. Oh, wow and took the engine out of the Fiat and put the H gas motor in with a brand new set of angle port heads and he went racing. Wow. And so that's how this car came about. And so he raced it in 1974, wow. 1975. And by then the Fiat was completely redone and he wanted to go back running H gas. So this car was sold in 75 to Harvey Cox in Texas. Okay. And then the motor went back into the Fiat and then he raced the Fiat for the rest of the year, and then the Fiat went to uh, Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. So that's kind of the history of that, at least the history of the car as Daryl right. was involved in. Uh -huh. But the history of the car continued on with the new owners. Okay. Like they had removed all the lettering and all uh, examples of Daryl's fingerprints. So when the car was seen from that point on, nobody knew it came from the race shop, and that was by design uh -huh. because they wanted to be the uh, the quiet guy in the corner with the full blown killer car. So that's that's kind of the history. And so now, and then uh, tell everybody how it you know how it came to be to what we see now. Okay. So the car was run uh, by several owners till the uh, eighty three ish eighty four, mostly in Louisiana. Okay. And then it was parked about eighty four eighty five, but then the motor went for bye bye and the seats and a few other parts. And uh, the owner of the car at that time wanted to just, he didn't want to sell it. So he put it in a greenhouse in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In a greenhouse. Yeah, good. And so he covered it with mattresses and pillows and blankets and tarps uh -huh. and tractors and stuff. And he basically barricaded the car to protect it from the elements. And it was there for 35 years. 35 years and so I started looking for the car in 2012 and I could not it was Daryl didn't remember who he sold it to okay. and because they did they, they everyone kind of lost track of it because it was no longer the race shop uh -huh. it was called white lightning 
Huh. And so people knew the car, but they didn't know, even Gary Bird didn't even know the car was Daryl's old car. Oh my gosh. And so for eight years, I chased this car down and through a lot of sources and calling around, I found it. And uh, the, the owner was really difficult to get a hold of, had an unlisted number, didn't want to talk to anybody. Wow. So I wrote him a letter. He didn't respond for eight years. <laughs> Oh my so I wrote him another one. Wow. And then finally he says, Dean, I, I did get your letter and the car's not for sale. And yes, I do have it. And so that's opened up a line of communication. Okay. And so it was another three or four years before he finally said, okay, you're the guy. <laughs> wow. So I, I, I think it's actually cool that in this day and age, a letter was written. It was the only way to get a hold of him. Yeah. He wasn't on the internet. I couldn't yeah. find an email. Uh -huh. And I found where he lived through uh, Google Maps. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. And so Google Maps showed me a picture of his house. Uh -huh. Okay. And he had a, like a car for him. There's the car. The car's got to be there. Wow. And so I took the address <laughs> and I wrote him a letter and just said, you know, you don't yeah. know me. I'm the, you know, and I, I'm hoping you own this car. Yeah. And he, and he just didn't answer for a year. Wow. And so then he finally did respond and he said, well, I kind of promised it to my nephew. We were going to go drag racing. <laughs> and so that went on for years. And then uh, unfortunately, uh, his uh, brother-in-law had a stroke. Mm. And uh, at that point, the family realized we're never going to go drag racing in that car. Right. And so Jimmy asked his uh, sister-in-law, said, you know, uh, we need to move on. And she said, yeah, we're not going to do it. And so uh, he finally said, okay, uh, the, the time is now. Uh, I, I guess we can sell it. Wow. So I said, okay, and wouldn't come up with a price. He uh, said, well, I want you to look at the car and uh, all this stuff. And uh, it took months to get it out of this greenhouse and get it out in the open so I could see it. And I said, yeah, I want the car because I... His photographs proved that yeah. it had the right stuff. Uh -huh. No motor, no trans, uh -huh. no seats. So all the good stuff was gone. Uh -huh. And uh, so finally, after months and months and months, he had it at his house up on wheels. And so it was August of 20. And so I made uh, an arrangement to go. I flew out there to look uh -huh. at it, buy it. And then a friend of mine, uh, Mike Cummings from Louisiana, he came and picked it up. We, mm -hmm. we all wanted to get it out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then <laughs> I had a great pick it up and ship it off. That's awesome. So that, that process awesome. from trying to find the car to the time I picked it up was eight Robert. years. Eight years. That's incredible. So I, stayed, I mean, I stayed on it. And I wouldn't let them out. Of yeah, because, seriously. Uh, I, I, I think you win the award for tenacity yeah. uh, in these interviews that we're doing. It's amazing. So that's that's how it came to be. And. Um, and then I just started chasing some of the parts, and, um, uh -huh. and then through Gerald Haddo, uh, he had passed away, and so uh, Linda Dunsworth, his widow, used to work for Hockey Agency, and I said, do you mind if I come over and look through Jer's negatives? And uh -huh. she said, sure, no problem. So I spent four whole days going through thousands of negatives, and I found the pictures for this car that he took in 74 from Carcraft and, uh, and some other magazines. Uh -huh. And so that allowed me to do these blow-ups that you see here. Uh -huh. And these blow-ups are were my guide to what the car looked like. Wow. And, and so I could, and I blew them up on this, the screen uh -huh. and I sized them. And so that told me how Daryl put this car together. And then when I took it apart, I kept really close uh, records as far as what fasteners he did and how he plumbed it. And, oh uh, and I said, this is the way it's going to go back together. <laughs> and now look, that, it, yeah. it's, uh, that's so cool. I love the story. I, and I, I had no idea it was Zenith Blue originally okay. until because there was only black in the picture. So, oh, okay. And when I walked up and saw it for the first time uh -huh. in Louisiana, I, I opened the door and I fell over. Oh, this wow. car's blue. <laughs> and so I looked in the engine. And so then it started making sense. So, so when I contacted Buddy Hale about painting it, I said, this one's going to be an odd one because I yeah. said it's going to be zenith blue on the inside uh -huh. in the engine compartment and under the trunk, and it's going to be lotus white on the outside. He goes, what? <laughs> and so we really had, he goes, I have to figure out how to do this. Yeah. Know, where the masking was. lines were and all that. Yeah. And so he goes, I've never done a car like that. And wow. And so yeah, that's the way it was. 
That's that they so had, cool. had Econo Motors. They had just painted the exterior, and they didn't want to repaint the interior because it was a race car. And so they just sprayed uh, what I call door jam. It was ah, sprayed the exterior. That's why it was too tall. I like it. So I like that's it. the way it is. So we put it right back the way it was. Well, you, you, seriously, it's been awesome. It was fun watching it get lettered and uh, just seeing it come together. Yeah. It's really cool. But it, it's it's funny. I'm telling you guys when when you hear stories like this and you just think about you know it's, I, I love <laughs> writing a letter. You know who writes a letter these I, days, yeah. right? Unless it's a letter of complaint. But you know, no, I think it's really I mean, really really if cool. If you really want it, you got it. You got to stay with it. Yeah, you got to. No. You have to have tenacity and just not let up on it. No, and no. Uh, you've got to work the system, I guess, and you got to figure out. How to, to convince the owner that you're the guy? That, yeah, you know, well, you're you not were definitely gonna, the yeah, guy. And, you know, I, I, you know, I just, I'm not going to put it up. I'm not going to name it. It's right. And I said it's not going to be white lightning anymore. It's uh -huh. going to be race shop, and uh -huh. he was okay with that. Cool. I said, unfortunately, I'm erasing the the later history of it and yeah. going back to its original. And Jimmy had no problem with that. I said, okay, as long as you know uh -huh. that this is the way I'm going to restore it. Yeah. Time. He said that's fine. He said. So, so what's the future? What's the future of the car? Uh, uh, the next is more mechanical. It's I'm going to get it professionally aligned to make sure that everything's straight. Uh, Rebleed the brakes. Uh, then I'm going to check the fuel system out to make sure we got the right pressure in the back and everything is copacetic as far as leaks and stuff. And just kind of shake the car down. Okay. And then we'll probably go. Uh, I'm going to have Ron Fleming drive it first. And uh, we may go to Irwindale, we may go to Verona, and cool. just do some easy uh, shakedown passes uh, just to get it one end to the other to make sure it goes straight. That's and so um, <laughs> I, I have no intentions of doing racing in competition. It's going to be more exhibition. Right. And then once it, we feel confident that it goes straight, the motor runs good, we got the jetting right, uh -huh. and it shifts good, and all, everything seems to work. And then uh, it's going. It's going to go to EBI, uh, awesome. hopefully next June with uh, Russell Ritchie. And the idea is that uh, it runs this next uh, EBI. Um, hopefully, if, uh, we don't have any pandemic restrictions. Right. And because we'll have Dave, uh, we'll have the Dave Andrews clone V modified compact that we can race side by side with okay. and reenact the. March oh, that's uh, final so cool. uh, with the, the, the race shop double cab, the, the tow truck for oh, this yeah, car yeah, will yeah. be there. Never seen that Even photo. the trailer oh, could be gosh. there, and so all and maybe the Fiat as far as uh, as a exhibit, as far as an exhibit, not okay. as a running car. Okay. And so the remaining Daryl air cool cars will uh -huh. be there, and the, so the photography aspects of it is just phenomenal. Yeah, and so I want to run it there and have. He soon Paul Schley or Ron Fleming drive the car. Yeah. And then after that, he'll probably come back to the States. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, maybe uh, Yoham in, in December. Oh my gosh. And I'm hoping that <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the one Black Four guys, or excuse me, the Moon Eyes guys, uh -huh. decide that that's a car that they might have. And that would be the ultimate goal for me to. To, to take it to Yokohama and have it on display there. That's so cool. And that's that's probably as far as I can project my involvement. In this <laughs> I think that's 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 one time of a projection. Somebody else to you know, put it in their collection and preserve the car. Very yeah, cool. I do not want to hurt this car. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, it's no. Because of the Interventure One and Two are both gone. Uh -huh. uh, we need to preserve some of the the history, the the, the Baton era cars. Yep. And. Uh, you can call them an empty car or whatever you want to say, but yeah. the cars that were built under that roof, I mean, you know, there are so many of them are gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, seriously, man, thank you. I, I think it's it's awesome. It, for me, I've, I've had the pleasure of following the story along, but, you know, thank you for your time and telling everybody on camera because, yeah. you know, this, this, this it'll live on forever. The story will live on okay. forever. I, and that's my, that was my goal to do this is to preserve this car yeah. and to make, even though it's not really legal for drag racing nowadays because of the, the, the safety aspects and things uh -huh. have changed, specifications, <laughs> uh, and I don't want to modify this to start uh -huh. bracket racing. I want right. to keep it the way it is. And yes, it may be a dinosaur and maybe it's not a real practical drag car anymore, uh -huh. but at least it will show people that's exactly the way that car was built yeah. in 1974 and set the national record. 
that's what it took that's to set awesome. the record back then. That is awesome. Uh, well, very cool. Anyway, well, well thanks, Dean. Yeah, yeah, thank that's you. about it. That's a lot, man. <laughs> okay. that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's, thank that's you, that's Dean. Amazing very story. cool. Yeah, very, very cool.